Hello, Shir. Hi, Francesco, and hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Zooming In, weekly conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. I'm Shir Gal Kuchavi, and with me is Francesco Spaniolo. Hello. Good to and see to you every, every Friday. It's a good way to spend some time together in this uh, socially distanced uh, world. Yeah, and you, with you and with our guests. And today yes. we have a special guest. Um, Carla Chapro, our, our colleague, is joining Hi. us today. Hi, Carla. Hi. <laughs> Carla, let me just quickly introduce you before we dive in. Carla is a lecturer at Berkeley Law. She's a senior fellow in the Institute of European Studies and curator of the Ansley K. Saltz Collection in the Department of Music at UC Berkeley. So Carla, we're thrilled to have you today and thank you for joining us and taking the time to be here today. Carla is our first guest. It's the first time that we we, we, we expand our conversations to a third voice. So we're really honored to have you. Uh, and, uh, you know, full disclosure, we've collaborated on a number of projects over the years. So uh, we're, we're old acquaintances and, uh, and we, we love uh, uh, what Carla brings to the table in her research to, uh, about uh, musical property looted uh, during World War II by the Nazis and uh, um, another Fun, but important fact is that Carla is also a violin maker. And as a violinist, I'm, uh, I'm much appreciative of that. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. So, I'm glad to contribute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So this is just a reminder before we start. Uh, it's a Zoom webinar, which means that our participants' videos are all hidden. Um, if you have any technical difficulties or any questions, please use the, the chat button on the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions for us, which uh, we'll leave a few minutes to answer at the end of this talk, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. As a quick reminder, um, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only museum collection associated with a major research university. And today we'll be talking about, with no further ado, mm -hmm. <laughs> today we'll be talking about uh, the historian Koppel Pinson and his, uh, his work in Europe between 1945 and 46. And we titled it on Hitler's balcony, which we'll explain momentarily. We'll be looking at uh, Koppel's Koppel Pinson's uh, travels and time in working in Europe uh, in, uh, in four, different, four different aspects. Uh, first, we'll discuss his trip, what he, or actually his work, and what he saw when he arrived to Europe. We'll move into uh, looking at his work at the Offenbach Archival Depot, um, and we'll explain, of course, what was done in that depot after the Holocaust. And then we'll look at his uh, work at the displaced persons camp in Germany. And finally, we'll be thinking about some of his closing remarks, some of his uh, notes when he returned from Europe in 1946. So Francesco, if I can invite you to tell us a little bit about Koppel Pinson. Absolutely. So um, just a reminder, the, the, the way we're presenting today is we're based on uh, some collection items in the Magnus, like every week. Every week we bring out one or a few items from the Magnus collection and discuss them and put them in context. And in this case, uh, um, the Magnus acquired in, uh, in 1991, from the widow of, of uh, Koppel Pinson, acquired two scrapbooks. Uh, the one that you see on the, on the screen right now, thank you sure for showing it. And a second one, similar format, but one contains photographs and the other one uh, contains letters, his correspondence. Uh, letters to his wife while he was in, uh, in Europe and uh, also correspondence with other uh, players on the scene of uh, cultural restitution and uh, relief efforts uh, towards uh, uh, Holocaust survivors in the aftermath of World War II. Um, a quick note on his biography, Koppel Pinson was born in what is today's Belarus in 1904, immigrated with his family three years later, so as a, as a child, as a baby, uh, to, to the United States and uh, died in 1961. He studied at the University of Pennsylvania and then got his doctorate at the Columbia, was an historian, historian of European nationalism, specializing in Germany and in the first half of the 20th century. There is a lot to specialize in terms of German nationalism. He taught at the New School for Social Research and uh, most notably at Queens College uh, in New York. And he, at the very end of, of World War II, he joined the US Army and he had a dual mission. 
uh, on the one hand, as we will discover, he was researching the provenance of the quarter million books that had been had been looted by the Nazis and were recovered uh, and and collected in various uh, depots like the Offenbach where he worked. And, um, and at the same time, he was working, and so he was doing this under the umbrella of the US Army, but he was also working yes. for the American Jewish uh, Joint Distribution Giant. Committee in providing mm -hmm. educational relief to, uh, to survivors who were living in DP, aka displaced persons camps, uh, across Europe, Germany, Austria, Northern Italy. And in the scrapbook that we're seeing here, we, we, what he did is that he documented his travels, his work, his activities, his encounters over this uh, long year between 1945 and 46. So the scrapbook begins with him on, a, on the ship leaving uh, the harbor New York City and then arriving to, to Germany. He was based in Frankfurt. And, uh, and then as we see traveling around Europe and there are pretty vivid images of him um, and that he took in Berlin and Berlin a city completely devastated after uh, World War II. And, and here he is mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Jewish academic from uh, Belarus and New York, an immigrant to the United States, uh, returning to Europe, standing on what was Hitler's balcony. He, 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 he writes, his, these are his own, uh, it's in his handwriting. So he says, mm -hmm. on Hitler's balcony, probably with an accent that I cannot imitate uh, <laughs> on my own. Um, but, uh, but here is, so last week somebody was watching, we gave a little preview, was saying, please don't show us Hitler, it's not Hitler here. Yes. So just as a disclaimer to our, uh, to our viewers. The implications of his work were multifold. Uh, he, you know, there, there was a scholarly mission. He was identifying volumes, especially Hebrew volumes, or all kinds of uh, books that had been looted. And um, Carla and you will give us a, yes. a better picture about this. Mm -hmm. There were, of course, legal implications. Whose books were these? Uh, were the, their rightful owners still, in, still alive? Not. And if not, who would be collecting these books, receiving them. There's interesting correspondence about this in, in the scrapbooks. Of course, political, because that, that was not just legal, but the, the oversight over this cultural heritage had broader implications. And last, but absolutely not least, emotional. What, what comes out of these scrapbooks is really uh, this man's emotions in facing the devastation of Europe, not just of European Jewry, but of Europe in general. And we see it in his photographs and what he documents. There are, of course, also moments of, re of, of reprieve in, in, in all of this, but uh, not quite. It's a pretty haunting cultural, Same. historical landscape that he paints. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also a very devastating experience, just like you said, Francesco. And we'll, we'll read a little bit of what he wrote uh, in a few minutes. So uh, the Offenbach Archival Depot was, uh, was a place uh, set up in storage outside of Frankfurt um, by, the, by the American Allied Forces. Uh, the American Allied Forces organized four central collecting points in their area. As a reminder, after World War II and the Holocaust, Germany and Berlin were divided into four areas um, for the four Allied Forces. Um, you in the U.S., um, Britain, Great Britain, Fra France, and of course Russia, and these are the four. These are four images that I found that represent. I think they do a pretty good job representing the type of items that they had put together in these central collecting points. So the first one established was in Marburg, uh, and then there were Offenbach. Uh, Munich and, Wis and Wiesbaden. In Marburg, there were lots of uh, art, art objects and cultural heritage objects. In Offenbach, uh, Offenbach was a place where they kept a lot of the books, a lot of the uh, sacred uh, objects as well. Wiesbaden is where a lot of the ritual objects were moved to. And in Munich, a lot of paintings and again, works of art. Um, Carla, I'd like to invite you to join us and maybe we can discuss for a few minutes uh, where did these books come from and uh, and what happened to them? So um, the Offenbach Archival Depot, by the time it actually closed in its four years, had about um, three, th three million, it was actually more than three million objects. And these books were um, confiscated. They weren't all confiscated. They were actually mixed in with displaced books, but um, the Hitler's Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the ERR, was a major contributor to the confiscations. It was a Nazi task force 
um, that carried about carried out systematic plunder of material culture in Europe, and books were just a category of that. So, and that began in about July 1940 under the leadership of Alfred Rosenberg. Uh, but importantly for the books, Rosenberg was the head of the also the head of the Hochschule, which the Center for National Socialist Ideological and Educational Research, which confiscated Jewish archives books and um, for ideological and propagandist purposes associated with the destruction of Jews and their culture. So the books were shipped from all over Europe, um, and there were other sources of confiscation as well, but they were, the ERR was a major one. They were shipped um, to various institutes, but one of those was the Institute for Research of the Jewish Question. And um, um, books were that often... Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. No, go yeah. ahead, Cher. No, and that institute was set up in Frankfurt, uh, which is eventually right. where a lot of these materials were found and then moved to the Offenbach Archival Depot, which was very close right. by. Right, so when, when, Pinson, when Professor Pinson arrived, he actually started working in the Rothschild Depot in, in Frankfurt. And there were about a million books there when he started. They actually, according to his scrapbooks, they didn't have power in the winter, but he worked through the winter. He arrived in autumn and um, just um, the US, uh, third US Army actually found this institute's books in the Hungan mine and they moved them to this depot. So um, he was able in January to get permission from General Clay with the help of Judge Simon Rifkin, who was an advisor to the U.S. Theater on Jewish Affairs, to uh, loan 25,000 books uh, that were not able to be connected to owners for restitution for loan to um, the displaced persons camps. And so he began in Frankfurt. And um, in terms of Offenbach, it took until March, March 2nd, them to actually move to a bigger depot. They ran out of room and that picture you saw with all of the books um, is where they ultimately ended up ironically in an IG Farben uh, yeah, factory right. where they ma made uh, components of you know chemicals for the concentration for the um, gas chambers. So um, yeah and maybe we can talk for a few minutes about Pinson's uh, report and Pinson's work at the at Offenbach. Uh, he was responsible for identifying books for dividing the books into groups. And I'll just read this brief, um, oh, this brief quote, quote, and then maybe we can both take it from there. Okay. Every day German civilian helped help would set up about 5,000 books on shelves for me. I set up six categories of books to be selected. Rabbinical books, reference books, textbooks, Yiddish literature, Hebrew literature, literature in other languages. So, we briefly mentioned where these books came from, but maybe we can think about who were the owners. Um, could they be identified? Maybe they couldn't. Um, and what, what was he actually doing? What, what, right. what eventually so, happened? <laughs> right. So, and I don't know whether you want to show the floor plan. So yeah. the, the building, the Offenbach Archival Depot had five floors. It was enormous. And um, they were sorting for, um, they have all these floor plans. So you can see the Pinson Hall here, he got his own area for sorting. But they were um, categorizing by nation, by region, by language. Um, they had photographs of uh, book plates and labels. It was an unbelievable effort to try to identify all the owners so that the, ob the books could be restituted to the presumed country of origin if there was identifiable information. And then those nations would then return the objects to their owners. Um, but for things that couldn't be identified, he was sorting. And he made a comment in his scrapbook that um, to get to this, to about 20,000 books that he hoped to loan to the displaced persons, he had to handle approximately 300,000 volumes uh, looking for appropriate books according to his categories for loan. And this Pinson Hall that we're showing right now, uh, and here, here he is at the entrance to Pinson Hall. What was happening in that room, in that area? Well, he was, parents. yeah, he was, he was looking through these books for what was appropriate. He had assistants. Um, they obviously had to be fluent in Hebrew and Yiddish and other languages that, that were appropriate for all the different educational purposes in the DEP camp. So it was an enormous effort. He, he also helped with YIVO's recovery uh, of the books that were looted and ended up um, in the Allied uh, possession for restitution to Yiva. So here you actually see a mixture 
of the Frankfurt Depot, mm -hmm. uh, the Rothschild Library, and uh, the Offenbach Archival Depot with all of the people working together here under his direction. He also advised, the, he was a Jewish advisor for them, the directors of the Offenbach, Ar Offenbach Archival Depot on these issues. And of course there was, thank you, Carla, I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course there was then the question of where to transfer uh, the other materials. So whether to ship them back to their, to their countries of origin, if they were identified, whether to, even if it was even possible to try and identify private owners, which was rarely possible, um, and, and few of them could even were alive at the time, whether um, they should be um, transferred to DP camps, as you just said, and we'll discuss it in a minute once again, or whether it should be sent to other uh, Jewish communities that reestablished themselves or in other places around the world, such in places such as the United States or Israel. And he had this correspondence with uh, Judah Magnus, and this is just a little portion from a letter that Magnus wrote to, to Pinson in May 1946. And maybe I can read this uh, quickly to, to our listeners today and we, can, and we can say a few words about the politics behind this and the, and the ideas of, of, and the questions and the more, whether they were moral or political about where would these items move into and the importance of Jewish cultural heritage. So Judah Magnus writes in May 3rd, 1946, Hebrew University thinks that it would be a matter of great importance for it to be recognized as the legitimate heir of destroyed German Jewry, and that on this account, other Jewish institutions should be interested in having the Hebrew University appointed chief trustee of the Jewish libraries and other collections which were looted by the Nazis. We are not to be the chief country for the absorption of living human... Oh, sorry, we are to be, I apologize, the chief country for the absorption of living human beings who have escaped from Nazi persecution. By the same token, we should be the trustee of these spiritual goods which destroyed German Jewry has left behind. It will be nothing less disgraceful if there were any competition between Jewish organizations for the receipt, for the receipt of these books, manuscripts, and other collections. We're putting forward a claim which no one else can put forward, i.e. the claim to, the chief, to be the chief spiritual heir of those Jewish institutions for whose books we want to be appointed trustees. So Carla, maybe you can um, share with us a little bit of what you think about this. And also because you work in this field and you've been doing research on, and provenance research specifically, you can tell us what people even today can do if they want to recover any types of, of property, of cultural property that was looted during the Holocaust. Uh, okay. Well, in the, you know, there was debate over this. That there was competition in the end, I think. And uh, of course. about 40% yes. of the objects that were unidentified, that were so-called airless, went to Israel and about 40% 40 40 went to the Western Hemisphere, including many institutions in the United States, and about 20% went to, to other regions. In terms of uh, people today, I mean, that's a complicated question, and there are actually uh, curricula uh, developed on provenance research, but um, it depends on the object, whether it was confiscated, whether it was stolen, whether it was sold under duress, and there are many different factual scenarios. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, but, thank um, you. Okay, uh, guide me if I am <laughs> going in the wrong direction, but no, um, that's perfect. You know, I thought I would uh, just kind of uh, list, um, you know, the records are very dispersed in many nations, in many languages, and um, in public and private archives. And the, uh, having an expertise on the object you're looking for makes a big difference because then you understand that universe in terms of research, but confiscation files, state export and shipping records, or uh, post-war claim files, auction records, dealer, collector, institutional collection files. And nation, nations have created databases that focus on both looted or uh, otherwise missing objects and found objects with unidentified owners. So those are all possible sources. And uh, um, so that's so just kind of a you. rough answer, yeah. No, it's, a, it's an excellent answer because it is, does require a lot of legwork. Yeah. But let's quickly jump into the life of the display in the displaced persons camps. Yeah. Um, so so uh, just as a reminder for those who are listening and watching from home, Judah Magnus, who is the namesake of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life and its predecessor, the Judah Magnus Museum in Berkeley, 
was actually writing, when he was writing We, he was talking about Israel because he had immigrated to Israel in the 19-teens and, and then was the, the founding president of the Hebrew University. So he was advocating for Israel and for the Hebrew University, but it was two American scholars debating about this uh, <laughs> across countries, etc. And And the issue of displacement also, of course, was, was very much part of uh, everybody's experience in, in, in those days. And we see it here, as we were saying earlier, Corporal Pinson was, uh, among other things, providing educational relief to uh, to people who are living in DT camps, in displaced uh, persons camps across Europe. This is a helpful uh, infographic from the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington about the, 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 the location of the many DP camps across Europe. Uh, there were also some in Northern Italy that are not uh, shown here. You know, as a resident yeah. Italian, I have to <laughs> talk about this, but actually Pinson <laughs> traveled to Italy and there are some interesting yeah. photographs there as well. Um, uh, this map shows some of his uh, uh, travels. He was essentially yes. providing books that he had selected out of what he found in the Upper Ar Ar Archive as a way to provide educational materials to um, survivors who had been, among other things, deprived of education for many years. Um, and, um, and, so he and, and also helping with, uh, uh, with the general rebuilding of Jewish life. And his photographs are really amazing because they show uh, everyday life in the DP camps that he visited. And what we see is, you know, um, educational, vocational training, Holocaust commemorations, the earliest ones. So we see also the mm -hmm. politics of this, the many flags and the languages that are involved in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in these sort of uh, ritual uh, commemorations. Uh, early Zionist activities, I believe some of them are mm -hmm. on the on the photo, uh, cultural activities like concerts. We got a little snippet, you know, he, he has a photo of uh, uh, the Polish Jewish pianist, uh, uh, Marian Filar, 1912, uh, uh, 2012. He lived a very, very long life. He started recording uh, actively after the war when he moved to the United States. This is a recording circa 1950, uh, but just a few years after the, the, the concert that, that we see portrayed in Pinson's photograph. So, we're just hearing, listening to a little bit, a little bit of Chopin played by Marianne Filar. And here we're seeing just a few more uh, pages from his, uh, from Pinson's scrapbook of other um, DP camps of, of people together, um, you know, children together in schools being educated. On the bottom here, you have the, the police, the Jewish uh, DP poli police in the younger time camp. And here is the ceremony, the unveiling of the monument for the unknown Jewish soldier. Uh, also in Le uh, Lepine um, DP camp. I'm going to quickly uh, jump to the end because I don't want us to miss our short discussion, but this is an example of Passover in Berlin, of course, when packages of, uh, of kosher um, matzah uh, meal arrived and, uh, and that's the preparation uh, before Passover. So uh, when Pinson returned to the United States, he actually wrote in his diary and he wrote some letters which really reveal his emotional state and his kind of thinking back and looking back at these travels uh, uh, in Europe and his experience. And I'll just read maybe, I'll try to read it as quickly as possible so we can quickly say something and say and answer any questions that you might have. So he wrote this in 1946. I left Germany on Tuesday, August 13. I left with a real feeling of sadness, sad at leaving so many people still in need, 
said that there were good people coming in just as I was leaving and when they needed me, said that the way in which my mission had deteriorated. I'm convinced, however, that, an, that another organization must be established for the educational and cultural work in Europe. I'll just skip this quickly. My year was one of frustration, of bitterness and disappointments. Yet it was also a year rich in emotional and psychological experience. I feel more humble than ever. I know less than I ever knew, but I experienced what chaos means, what occupation means, what sinning and losing a war means. And greater than all, of course, is satisfaction that I was the first and only one to bring at least something of culture to thousands of Jews who had been devoid of it for so many years. So maybe as the ending point of this talk, Carla, I can invite you to talk to us a little bit about the meaning of your work and maybe say a few words about how important it is for us to, to remember how important memory is and to fight this forgetfulness that we sometimes feel surrounds us. Uh, and, and just uh, to finish on his comment here, he was the only one actually who got permission. This program ended. He, no one else was able to distribute any more books after he left such a short period. So um, my work, so I'm focused on musical material culture uh, rest, losses. And um, there are some multifaceted why it's, reasons why it's important for remembrance, for restitution, and for the truth. Um, I view this, uh, you know, focusing on the granular evidence and the lives tethered to that evidence and the histories scattered in archives in the U.S. and Europe. It provides a, a sense of justice through historical reconstruction. That, to me, that's important personally, and I think it's important to the families and the public at large to have this information, which for music is kind of a little bit of a lost history that is, really needs reconstruction. Thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carla. And we do have uh, questions from, from people who are Zooming in with us today. Excellent. Uh, so I'm going to just share them with you. Thank uh, you. Since I, I suspect that I see them and you do not see them. Because yes, I can see the them The politics today. of Zoom. <laughs> um, so uh, a question is, what happened uh, to materials that were identified with countries of origin that became part of the Soviet Union after the war? Well, things were re repatriated to Russia. Uh, and um, so right after the war, uh, those objects were repatriated to the presumed country of origin. Uh, but there was a lot of, you know, it was like trying to unscramble the egg in terms of a lot of these objects. But um, uh, things in the American zone, there were repatriations to those nations. Yeah. And Quite a bit of debate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we also have a question. This is a very pointed question from uh, actually, I'm revealing the, the, the name of the, of the person asking it is uh, our colleague and friend Zachary Baker, who has been Judaica librarian and head of collections at, uh, at Stanford libraries for, for, for many years. And, and he's asking you, Carla, it's, if your research has taken you across the bay to the Stanford University libraries, the Salo Baron's papers are housed there along well, with the Companion Jewish Social Studies papers, there is extensive first-hand documentation there concerning distribution of Jewish cultural assets after World yeah. War II. Baron, Baron knew and corresponded with Pinson, and also Hannah Arendt, uh, yes. not so incidentally, worked yes, under exactly. Baron's supervision on this effort. Um, I'm so glad that uh, that came up in this discussion. I have been mm -hmm. to Stanford, and I would, look, I would be so glad to meet um, yeah. um, Zachary. Yeah, and if we'll, I may we'll add, oh, yeah, we should make, organize make a connection, it. but yes, sure, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that. Thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Baker. I actually visited and did extensive research in the Salo Barn archives at uh, Stanford University a few years ago, and, uh, and I did work on the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, which was the organization that was set up to be responsible for the what was called the airless Jewish cultural property and for dispersing that after uh, Pinson had left uh, Europe. So that is a whole other project and a whole other discussion that mm -hmm. <laughs> we can get into in the future. But thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, any I last questions? Us, I think we're we're good. These were really really good, <laughs> highly <laughs> professional questions. questions. So yeah. uh, we're, so thank we're you. meeting I think, next week. So first of all, again, thank you, Carla. Yes, thank you. Very, what a pleasure. Much. Thank you for being our first, uh, first honored guest. guest. Thank we'll you for more. having me. Thank you for We'll have more. We're going to we're going to enjoy doing this and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it was wonderful to to share uh, 
the the Zoom box <laughs> with you. Um, well, I'm so grateful for the Magnus and for all your work and the, in the amazing holdings we have in this public collection. It's incredible. It's a great yeah. resource. And, yeah. you. and next week we're back with uh, Pushing Buttons, pushing buttons. right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a wonderful talk. And we have another special guest in a com from a completely different field, uh, the artist Nikki Green, who will be talking about some of her work and especially her work that was created uh, for an exhibition uh, on, on the Karai Jews uh, that was uh, held at the Magnus uh, two, years two years ago. ago. Two years yeah. ago, yeah. We're, it, we don't know what the past and the present in, is anymore in this in this pandemic days. But yes, a couple of years ago, and uh, Nikki Green is now a well a graduate of UC Berkeley's uh, uh, program in art practice, and now teaches at UC Berkeley as well. So yeah. we'll have plenty to discuss about yes. ancient, new, reformulated, reinvented rituals. So every week, you see Carla is a different topic. We jump from one to the next, uh, and that's because, as you were saying, we, we, we are backed up by an incredible collection that you were saying at the beginning, one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world. So there is plenty to explore, and we do it week after week. So thank you thank both, you thank you all of us, and thank you everybody who joined us uh, from, uh, from all over the world. Don't forget to register for next week's program. Yeah, and hope to all see All the information then. is online, uh, magnus.berkeley.edu. Uh, here. See you next week. It's on the bottom. Thank you all. Have a good weekend and, and see you next week. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.